So guys, I messed up. Buying a salvage Ferrari with what I consider mystery damage sight unseen was a pretty big risk, one that I thought paid off when the car effortlessly moved off the transport truck. That is until I heard this noise. No way. If you're following up from the last video, you know that after hearing this knock, I checked the oil dipstick, which was completely dry. I proceeded to add a lot of oil until I saw a normal level on the dipstick, which was the wrong move, and I drowned my Ferrari in oil. Now, it wouldn't start at all. Being that we're working on a Ferrari here, the problem seems a hundred times worse than if we were working on a Ford. But either way, a car is a car, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person in history to make this mistake. Perfect? I am not. And if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that I make mistakes, and a lot of them. If you can learn from your mistakes, you'll become better at the job at hand. However, overfilling the engine oil? Come on! I admit, it's a stupid mistake, especially since I bought a shop manual before the car was even delivered to me. The first maintenance section in the shop manual is all about engine oil, and it clearly states, in red, Il controllo del livello deve essere esuito a motore caldo. Or for on Ferrari speak, the oil level must be checked with the engine warm. If I just opened the manual and read these few words, it would have saved several hours of cleanup and a good chunk of money in cleaning supplies. Mind you, this is only two lines out of nearly a 1500 page shop manual, which should definitely come in handy with the other problems that pop up on the Ferrari. These shop manuals are awesome and they're cheap. The one for my Ferrari was only 20 bucks and it's the same information the techs at the dealership use. They're amazing for in-depth repair, like the timing belt section here with the pictures on this specific Ferrari, something I'll be inspecting very soon. And they're great for a new DIYer who just wants to start with some regular maintenance on their car. If you could use a shop manual for your own car, be sure to check out EMO simply by clicking my link in the description box below. It's where I get all of my shop manuals. They're available for pretty much any make or model. And like I said, they're inexpensive and they've saved me a countless amount of hours while working on cars. Now after the oil change and all the engine bay cleanup, it's time to try again. This is the moment of truth. We've cleaned up our mess, now it's time for the sun to do its job, but what a relief. I mean, I just couldn't imagine, this car was delivered, what, 72 hours ago, and it ran just fine coming off the truck. I'm guessing something to do with the car being tilted on its side while I was taking the wheels off. Uh, move the engine oil over to one side causing it to run rough and it was probably just missing right off the bat I took that as a knock shut it off thought it was low on oil But here we are it ran great just now and this is the only British racing green Ferrari I know that I've ever seen it's really just a wild wild color but there are some condition issues up close if you look at a few things so what i want to do right now is get this car nice and clean get these bugs off the windshield and then we'll be able to give a better assessment of the overall body condition and see what else we're going to need besides the repairs to our floor The hood looks pretty good even just a few feet away, but this thing sustained quite a bit of damage. If you go and look underneath, this body shop might have done a little bit of disassembly. Why they would have taken the hood prop rods out, I have no clue, but they're both missing. So somebody had to have just thrown this hood up as hard as they could, and look, it bent it up right here in the corner. This probably hit down here on the windshield. This hit on the wiper arm, it's bent in here. It's creased in along the side where it just folded a little bit. We got similar damages here on the passenger side right here, right here. This whole hood needs to be reworked and it might be tough to do so because it's made out of aluminum. Although they are doing aluminum body panel repair, it's just that there is 
a body line that goes across the entire hood where we have a lot of our damage. So it'll be interesting to see if I'm gonna need a new hood or whether this one can just be reworked. Now check this out. While they threw the hood open, they crack the windshield and these windshields retail for about $5,000 new. So by someone just throwing the hood open, damaging the hood, damaging the windshield, this was easily a six or $7,000 mistake. Now inside the front trunk, which is actually pretty large for a supercar, this is exactly how it came to me with an empty battery maintainer box, missing the Ferrari tool kits, but with a full can a Ferrari fix a flat but the most interesting thing in this trunk besides the aftermarket amplifier for the stereo is right here the original paint code sticker and you can see it says Verde British Racing so this Verde British Racing green is definitely the original color that this car left the Ferrari factory with I've already gone over all the issues here on the passenger side paint wise the only thing we need to take care of is remove this rocker get it repainted but what we're doing first and foremost is getting that floor repaired we're gonna pull this back in the garage so I don't die of heat stroke out here we're gonna clean up the interior a little bit and start disassembling things but first I want to see if the top actually works I haven't tested it yet so we've got power on in the car and sometimes on convertibles there's latches you know right underneath the mirrors I don't see anything like that I think all we got to do on this car is pull this button down here which is not secured down very well, but it's doing something. But it's doing something. Oh. Check it out. Wow, this car looks phenomenal with the top down. And I'm glad we did put the top down because we need to get rid of all that nasty dirt right there. And with the top down, it will make it much easier when we pull our seats out. This car is so weird with this immobilizer system. All right, all right, all right. All right, let's try that again. Now it doesn't want to start. Put on the brake. What is going on? All right, here we go again. Foot on the brake. Jeez, what a strange, strange car. You know what I think when I was unlocking and locking it before, I was actually trying to start it with the doors locked. I don't even get how all that works, but we got it on now and every time this car actually starts and actually sounds good, I want to do nothing but actually take it on a long, long drive. We're in first gear. Come on, let's go. Uh-oh. Now there's no power. I'm putting my foot on the gas, and it's my foot is almost all the way down. It's not moving. Oh, geez. Here we go again. Oh. There, it's in neutral. What just happened? So strange. Here we go. It's in first gear. It's like the clutch is bad on it or something. Another way our shop manuals pay off. I knew that this is the engine oil reservoir and I thought that that was the transmission fluid reservoir and I was wrong according to the shop manual. The transmission fluid reservoir is underneath this panel. So we're gonna just pop this open really quick. Well, this is full. So there shouldn't be any issue with our transmission fluid. Big thanks to my brother and Lil Mike who just bailed me out on this one. I wish I could have recorded and showed you what occurred, but like you just saw when I was putting the car in first gear, it felt like the wheels were turning this much when you gave it gas, no RPMs on the dash. So I think there's something wrong with the clutch system, but basically my brother and I got in the back side of the car, Lil Mike sat in the driver's side, put it in gear and gave it that little bit of gas to get the wheels just started for us once we started rolling it, which was very difficult because keep in mind, this tire 
is flat. It was like bump starting a manual transmission and the car kind of effortlessly just drove itself in here. Now I've got a lot of guesses as to what the issue is, but like we learned earlier, making a mistake overfilling our oil reservoir when we could have just looked at the shop manual. There's another tool that is a must have when you're working on these cars, that's an OBD2 reader. We're gonna plug ours in and we're gonna scan for codes because we did get a check engine light there on the dashboard. From what I read, if you wanna diagnose a Ferrari properly and easily, you have to have a Ferrari dealership level diagnostic scanner and these would cost me more than I actually spent on this car. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Now I have a handful of code readers and so I started off with my most expensive and most capable one. Now this launch code reader did have the option to select Ferrari and to my surprise, it pretty much popped up every single module that this car has. So right here it did show a code P1630. Floating around online is a list of all the error codes related to a Ferrari 360 and P1630 is an electrical issue. It says ECU bank one and two is malfunctioning. If we really did have malfunctioning computers, this would be an expensive repair. It just doesn't make sense. The car was working now. It's not something just must not be getting a proper signal. And remember, the TAC is showing zero when the car doesn't work. Now, I swapped my most basic code reader, which is really simple just to access live data. And if you look right here, it does show that something in the car is receiving a signal showing the car's idling at 1200 RPM, even though the tachometer is at zero. Well, I'm no Ferrari mechanic. There's got to be an electrical communication issue issue somewhere and a lot of the electrical components are actually located behind the seats in this car right now it's a great time to start disassembling everything here on the passenger side i've already started by taking out that nuisance glove box that was stuck open and we will work on that at another time but i'm going to disconnect the battery we're going to take this seat out and then right back here is one of the three fuse boxes that's in this car now that code that we did get it is electrical related so there's a chance that maybe it's just a blown fuse, although it's highly unlikely. We'll check that out once we get all of this torn apart. off the bare floor here all the carpets have been pulled up and I was really surprised I thought the damage was somewhere in this area but actually it's quite a bit further forward can you see right there that cracked aluminum brace there this is gonna be a little bit tougher than I anticipated I thought that if the damage was right here we just take a little bit of a hammer to it push it back down and weld it from underneath or up top whatever made more sense back there we've got a little bit of an issue because if you wanted to use a ram to push this down, you know, there's not a lot of room to hammer it. You got HVAC plastic right above you. You'll break a lot of money worth of stuff and that wouldn't make any sense. So the game plan for this is obviously to strip out the remaining foam. There's a little bit of foam. The main wiring harness for the car runs right where we need to be working. Get that out of the way. And we're gonna just have to get the correct hammer for the job to be able to push that back down. It's gonna be really close quarters, but I think we'll be able to do it. There is a lot going on back here behind the passenger seat, and this is just half of the engine's brain. The other half is behind the driver's side. And if that weren't complicated enough, this computer runs that side of the engine, and that computer runs that side of the engine. It's all over the place. But I am more and more convinced that our issue here is an electrical issue, like some sort of sensor, or maybe a fuse, maybe a relay, why the tack is is reading zero. I think that's our big hint. So I went ahead, I pulled every single fuse. There's only a dozen of them on this side. They're all good. But really the next thing we got to do is check our relays, make sure they're good. We've got a lot of electrical testing that I need to do. When you're doing some sort of repair or maintenance on a car and then you go to use that car and another issue crops up 99% of the time, at least in my experience, that is not a coincidence. Something I did, whether that oil spillage or taking apart some of the 
engine bay there could definitely be a contributor as to why the car is acting the way it is now however this car did come from the auction with the mechanical and the undercarriage damage the mechanical damage showed that the car did start but it did not run and drive under its own power so that tells me that this is an intermittent issue intermittent and electrical issues go hand in hand with each other and so I've got a lot of diagnosing to do electrical stuff is generally right in your face like a blown fuse or just a loose connection somewhere but when you've been working on several different things several hours together it's best to just take a few minutes off take a breather regain your thoughts because a lot of the times you'll come back to working on the car and you'll find your issue very quickly. And that's what I plan to do. And when I come back in a few hours to work on this car, if I figure out something before I'm able to release the video, I'm gonna update you on Instagram. You can go right here or just click the link in the description box below. I'm also gonna be studying up those shop manuals because there might be some keys and some tips in there that might help me out. And if you want your very own shop manual, make sure you just check out the link also in the description box. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for watching today. I'll catch you very soon.